back on the road again, doing some house calls, visiting some fellow builders such as yourselves. And during this time, I've seen a good cross section of several engine installations. So over the next month, divide over a couple episodes, every other episode, I'm gonna show you the Zenith platform, the Zenith airframe, and installations of a Corvair, Viking, and a Franklin engine. So I'll give you the opportunity to see what takes place firewall forward in these many different installations. All right, we're doing another house call today down here in Fort Myers, Florida, to check out a Corvair powered Zenith. All right, this is Ramesh Nori here. I'm from uh, Buckingham Air Park, Fort Myers, Florida. Here is my baby. This is a Zenith 750 Cruiser. It's a whole match kit that I got. I got the whole set from Zenith directly. All right, so what, when exactly did you start this project and which parts did you start with first? Well, one of the first things I started like any other builder is the rudder toolkit. I went to the workshop there, rudder workshop offered by Zenith. I went to the factory. I believe it was four years or five years ago I went. Man, I don't want to remember. It seems like a long way. Um, great job. Actually, I wanted to start with the stole version. That actually uh, on the internet and all, I found it more impressive. But when I met with Roger and Tesh flew their uh, planes at the factory, man, I'm so blown away with this cruiser performance there, their cruiser. So shifted to cruiser, did my rudder workshop, and there you go, five years later, four and a half, five years later, here I am ready with the, my cruiser. It took a long time, but hey, job, family, life, everything came in the way, but not bad, not bad. So start with the rudder kit, then did you progress to the wings or fuselage next? So after rudder kit, I ordered almost the whole kit, the rest of the stuff. Um, but in the order of preference, I built the wings so that I can easily store them across the wall because I was building it in my back patio uh, back in that house. And then I built the fuselage. Once everything is ready is when we just put it together. So the order went with the rudder kit first, then elevator, horizontal stabilizer, then wings, then fuselage. Well, actually, I think you said rudder and then seats. You had your <laughs> seats made so you can sit in it, yes. huh? I mean, I didn't build the seats, but yeah, thanks to Robert uh, Lemke from Germany. He was stationed there at that time. I was able to get in touch with him and he built one of my amazing seats. I love them. They are like deluxe version of uh, cruiser seats. So one of the questions I love to ask people is what was maybe one of the most uh, challenging parts of your build and then what's the most enjoyable part of the build so far? Oh, that's a difficult thing. Uh, now uh, in the retrospective, when I look back, I think the most challenging part of the bait would be to mount the wings, <laughs> truth be told, because I didn't have any external help, but thankfully use the tools. My kids were able to help. That's where it is. The aligning of the wings was the most challenging for me. Um, but the most enjoyable is painting it. So I went with that uh, traditional, of course, on the forum, <laughs> experimental, right? With the uh, roll and tip method, the one we use for uh, aluminum boats. So I got the polyurethane paint and painted it. So that was the most fun, really. All right, so one thing immediately different about your build uh, with the cruiser is you don't have the baby five by fives. What made you decide to upgrade? Uh, believe it or not, this. If I have the 5x5, five five, I'll be hunching all the time to get in the plane, to get out of the plane. Barring that, actually, I wanted to explore a lot of grass runways and all. Yeah, people say that 5x5 five five were good, but I got also heavily influenced by a cruiser built by uh, Gary Motley. He has the same setup, off-road cruiser, you can call it. So that's, that's the reason too. It, was that well after, uh, or did you order it from the factory from the, from the very start? So, from the factory, I got the 5 by 5s first, but again, factory is kind enough, so I sent them back the regular uh, wheel set and then upgraded to the stone version. All right, moving around uh, to the front here, many choices for engines, lots of engine options. Uh, what did you choose and why? Um, this is a Corvair engine, 2850, 110 uh, horsepower by William Wynn, auto conversion. I love it. I mean, the simple reason being the simplicity of the engine, the 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 way the whole engine is with uh, 
um, how should I say, very few electronic options or points of failure runs well, works well, and it meets my mission standards. So that's the main reason I went with Corvair and the build was also phenomenally easy actually. Not too much complex. Yeah, it might look overwhelming in the beginning like any other engine. I'm the first time builder, but overall I love it. The way it came in, the way everything went in through. Pretty simple. And this is available also with a lot of uh, like off the shelf parts. So it was just Correct. pretty easy to just mount up and go Correct. with it. Most of the stuff, and uh, William officially says that too, you can actually find the parts from Napa store, the local Napa stores, auto stores. So that's where you can buy the stuff and uh, pretty easy to maintain even the engine oil and all. We don't need to go with very high end oils. It's basically the shell oil you can rotella. You can find it. It's pretty simple stuff with all the parts, all the accessories are pretty openly available. For rest of the stuff related to Corvette, we can reach out to William, you know, he stocks most of the parts. Uh, each engine has a very specific cowling. Yeah. So uh, I understand this one had a little bit of fabrication. So I talked about what it was like to, to get this cowling to work. Yeah, I mean, um, it's again, there is a learning curve for, for every job we do in experimental aviation. For me specifically, the nose ball came from uh, William directly. So that's a pretty straight fit. You just need to adjust. And this metal cowling actually comes from Wisman. You can buy it from William Wynn's Fly Corver website. However, uh, the bottom part is easy to do. The top part, typically, you need to roll it. And that was a little bit of a tight thing for me in a way <laughs> because I don't have a roller, at, a roller at home. So, but fortunately, the machine shop close by, they were able to help me. So, you get a flat sheet metal. You actually basically do a development as if like you are, you are, you know, in the tailoring section or in uh, sheet metal sections, how you actually do the development of cones, etc. That is the thing that we learned in the high school you want to apply here. It came out well. I'm, I'm happy actually with the whole work, you know, so far. That's a fixed element on the top. However, the other two elements are rolled in, in the opposite way. And you just go with uh, the Zeus, you know, hardware to just clamp it down. Now, along with that, uh, inside the cowling, is you, you have to do the, uh, the, the internal baffles. Yeah. So, along with the cowling, you have to do the internal baffling. Did you get the kit from the Wiseman's, or did you create your own, or how did that come about? No, that's pretty much a very easy thing. You just order it from Aircraft Spruce, and William has very clear instructions how to do it. And I did, I did that. So, baffle metal pieces are from the Wiseman's. That's part of the cowling. But the rubber baffle kit is what you get from aircraft spruce just to be clear uh, and again it's it's a simple assembly of smaller parts put together and you just rivet them together and there you go it's it's one step at a time as if like you're building the plane the same way you continue to start building the baffles we are partnering with great companies like dynon avionics at dynon.com airtech coatings at airtechcoatings.com Aviation Youth Magazine at AviationUSA.com. The Aviators Clinic at AviatorsClinic.com. Take a moment to go visit their websites at the links found below in the description of this video. And visit our website at ExperimentalAircraftChannel.com for events, our video library arranged in easy to find playlists on specific topics, affiliate products, aviation merchandise, and so much more. So I've seen several different uh, ways of doing seat belts in these planes and you've got a, kind of a unique situation. How did you come about doing your seat belt setup? Yeah, so instead of the standard, you know, side seat belts, what I went with is uh, the race type seat belts, uh, racing seat belts. It's a, it's a actually designed for a five point harness, but I didn't go with the, uh, what is that called? Uh, your submarine belt. Submarine belt, it's yeah. not required. So initially, to just accommodate this, I got the whole kit from Crow Safety Gear. You reach out to Mr. Crow and tell that it's for Zenith 750. He has a standard set available. So they made it to the color of your choice. And once you get them, basically I fabricated this, uh, um, what is that called, mounting rod on the top. Uh, that way it, the whole things, the whole belts can be adjusted in such a way that you have some flexibility when it comes to the size of the passenger or the pilot sitting in it. Um, fit and finish came out very well 
um, it's perfectly in, in as per the safety standards I checked with the engineers from Zenith in Canada just to be sure you know even though it's experimental safety is first and uh, everything seems to be sitting in tight the whole uh, bottom seat belts left and right they are actually accommodated straight to the default locations where Zenith provides. All right, so give us a tour of what you decided to do with your uh, your instrument panel. Yeah, so this is uh, thanks to Dan Wiesman um, of Sports um, what is it? Sports Performance Aviation, right? Panther Panther Dan. So I reached out to him uh, one of the colleges after one of the colleges and after I think not the colleges after one of the Deland Aviation uh, showcase kind of thing and asked him what would he recommend in terms of a panel uh, you know setup instead of the native uh, six pack he recommended the grand rapids package he is an official uh, provider for it supplier for it the whole package it comes with engine monitoring system for all the six cylinders of the corvair and it comes with uh, primary display here and basically it comes with uh, your ADS-B, it comes with your GPS location, magnetometer and all that good stuff, whatever is required. So I got that, it's a Sports EX 7 inch version, not the big one because I thought that's good. And to complement it, I have my 4 flight operated uh, iPad here, iPad mini. So between these two, I think we are good. However, in general, what I went with is a manual airspeed indicator, like the standard gauge, just in case if the power fails for my uh, primary flight display. Other than that, um, I have a standard ICOM A220 radio and pretty simple setup really. If you see, there is nothing more complicated. The whole panel was built as three sections that are removable instead of one solid section and the center section handles my main electronics and the right section handles the whole uh, circuit breaker side of things and the left one for everything that the pilot has to operate on a regular basis. That's how I went with and I got the center console also from, uh, from Zenith directly uh, which can be considered as an extension to the panel per se where I mounted my um, audio connectors and uh, here you go I have my fuel valve there. So another thing I see a little bit different uh, other than the, the nylon plastic tube and you went with uh, an option for your brake lines. What did you use for that? So this is influenced by Steve from Air Aircraft Speciality Co. The actual provider of these braided uh, fuel lines, hoses and uh, brake lines. So I was fortunate to get in touch with him and after talking to him what I did was instead of the regular nylon uh, brake lines, replace this the same with uh, stainless steel braided teflon coated brake lines the same with my fuel lines also the primary reason being wear and tear and the longevity of the product and the weight wise it was not much of a difference couple of here and there but you know what i feel more comfortable with this now that in case if you do some kind of hard landing or whatnot or some sharp object hits it oh it's not going to cut this it might actually cut my tire but not going to cut the cables or these hoses that's the main reason right but it worked out very well he was uh, i was fortunate because it's one of the first corvettes also he worked on so now at least he has some kind of a standard setup for a gravity fed corvair oriented you know a cruiser how you can actually run the cables you just call him and say hey i have a 750 i'm using a cruiser or whatever the engine it is and it's a gravity fed and he has the dimensions right now i just i want a quick mention here you moved to an air park here uh, in the last couple years and yeah. i think this is the first time you actually had purchased a house and a hangar <laughs> before having your pilot's license or an airplane yes you want to talk about what that was like well, and then what it's like to live in an air park it's amazing feeling actually it's a blessing in disguise in a way um, like I said, right, I procured my wing set, everything, all the kit from Zenith and started building. Once the wings are done and the fuselage is done, now I came to a real problem. I don't have space to put them together. So I started looking at everywhere like, okay, let me get a hangar, this, that. Then I decided, you know what, why not just buy a home that has a hangar built in? Because here is the secret, you are 10 feet away from your plane any time of the day you can go that saved me so much time during this whole work from home as a part of the covid initiatives there you go i was able to actually finish the plane faster 
<laughs> yeah, and it's so nice to wake up a uh, couple of weekdays and weekends to the sound of engines and the props, you know, how people are flying around, how the most experienced people would come over to suggest you, to guide you. It's it's amazing feeling, guys. If you have an opportunity to find a home at Air Park, grab it. That's my that's my suggestion. You will not go wrong with that. Well, I think that's awesome that you literally you were you were committed. Yeah. You were all in before even getting your pilot's license and an airplane by <laughs> yes. buying into a flying Call community. Me crazy, yes, <laughs> yes, that's true. That's true because uh, the benefit of having a close to a 5,000 foot runway, asphalt runway, 200 feet from you, nothing can beat it. It gives you that immense confidence, you know. And what's the name of this air park again? This is called Buckingham Air Park. It's uh, FL-59. It's right next to RSW, Fort Myers International. Yeah. Yeah. So there you have it. You can come in and, and uh, buzz around much house anytime uh, in the Definitely. South Florida. Definitely. But do you want to come through the gate? You need to let me know. I need to come and open it for you. <laughs>